As I said at the start of the program, Dennis Kucinich has long been one of the most interesting figures in American politics. He became at a very young age the mayor of Cleveland. He then served uh, for 16 years in the Congress representing the 10th Congressional District as a Democrat. And yet that whole time, he was also a harsh critic of the Democratic Party and its leaders to the point that he ran for president in 2004 and 2008, often directing his harshest critiques for the leaders of the party and the orthodoxies that drove and formed it, including its commitment to and support for various wars. He appeared again as earlier this year, or late, uh, late last year rather, as the campaign manager for RFK Jr.'s presidential campaign. After leaving that campaign, he announced his candidacy for Congress representing uh, Ohio's 7th Congressional District where he is running not as a Democrat but as an independent against a first-term Republican Congressman Max Miller and we are delighted to speak to Congressman Kucinich and to hear about all the reasons why he is running. Congressman, welcome to our show. It's great to have you on. Glenn, I am very grateful to have a chance to uh, speak with you. I've waited for this for a long time and Let's go for it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We, we're excited as well. So let's begin with your candidacy, the candidacy that you are now committed to. Your opponent, as I said, is a Republican member of Congress, Max Miller. He was elected uh, in 2022 for the first time, so he's only a first-term member of Congress. Why did you decide that he needed a candidate, and why are you running as an independent rather than as a Democrat? Well, first of all, what's happening right now is there's an assault on the Constitution. Uh, the national security state is getting stronger than ever. Uh, this recent uh, uh, passing of uh, uh, the next iteration of Section 702 of FISA was destructive of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, we've got the World Health Organization waiting in the wings with a, a treaty that they're trying to get approved that would essentially uh, uh, vitiate numerous sections of the Constitution. Our economy right now is in a dangerous place for people in the 7th District. I've got plenty of reasons to run, and I have a, a district now that contains a, almost half of my old constituency. So I have the name recognition, I have the desire, the willingness to serve, the energy, the love of country. I'm ready to go back to Congress as an independent at a time when it's quite likely Congress could be split right down the middle. If it's 217 Democrats, 217 Republicans, and one independent, I'm ready to take up that challenge on behalf of the 7th District and on behalf of the American people. There were many members of Congress in the weeks after October 7th who made statements that I think can only be described as fanatical and even genocidal. Congressman Miller was an example of someone who made those kind of statements. Do we have the video of Congressman Miller? I wanna just play this video quickly. It's a short video of Congressman Miller talking about what he hopes Israel will do to the people of Gaza. Rashida Tlaib has the, I don't even wanna call it the Palestinian flag because they're not a state, they're a territory that's about to probably get eviscerated and go away here shortly as we're gonna turn that into a parking lot. So obviously calling for Israel to turn Gaza with 2 million, 2.2 million people in it, half of whom are children, into a parking lot is as genocidal and fanatical of a statement as you can make. But what is it beyond that specifically about Congressman Miller that you decided warranted a challenge? Well, I, I don't know if you have to go much beyond uh, a member of Congress who calls for genocide, uh, uh, implication being uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, revenge, collective punishment. I mean, all these things in violation of international law. Uh, a, a member of Congress ought to know better. And I think that what it reveals is uh, uh, not just a lack of, uh, of understanding uh, of, the, uh, of the moment, that it, it wasn't just uh, uh, Israel that, that, that suffered. Israel did suffer on October 7th, and all of us who care about people and the world and humanity uh, strongly protest what happened to Israel then. But what happened afterwards to the Palestinians as a result is also a disaster for the world. And it came at the hands of, of the Israeli government and continues to this day with policies of uh, starvation. Um, this, is, this is heartbreaking, but it's also wrong 
And so uh, Mr. Miller uh, represents a certain point of view that uh, supports uh, those unfortunate actions on the part of the state of Israel. And furthermore, uh, he recently, he's voted five times to uh, support Section 702 of FISA, which is a destructive undermining of the Fourth Amendment right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure. He voted against the Biggs Amendment, which would have uh, put, uh, actually put the Fourth Amendment back into the law by saying you cannot have a warrantless search. You have to have a uh, probable cause if you're going to search an American uh, and, uh, and you should go to court to, and you have to go to court to get it. He, he uh, came into Congress, uh, he's been there a year, uh, I, I don't think that he has the understanding, the maturity, and the judgment to be able to represent the district and to be able to engage in those uh, matters that are uh, important to the world, to America, and the people of the 7th District. So about this renewal of warrantless spying, domestic warrantless spying on American citizens, when we reported on it last night, we went through the history of how this program came to be and how the law that legalized it also came to be, because I think most people don't remember the history. I'm sure you do because you were in Congress at the time, but this was a program that Bush and Cheney authorized in 2002 and kept it a secret. The New York Times divulged it in 2005, won a Pulitzer for doing so, and at the time it was a huge scandal, the idea that the NSA was spying on Americans without the warrants required by law. There was talk of impeaching George Bush. And then under Nancy Pelosi, the solution that the Congress uh, embraced was to retroactively legalize warrantless spying on American citizens. That is the law that has subsequently been renewed. And Congress is ready to renew it as long as there was just some reform to it, including requiring a warrant. The vote failed by 212 to 212, obviously got a lot of support, not just from uh, Republicans, but also Democrats. In fact, more support for this bill from Democrats than Republicans. What does this say about the nature of the bipartisan political class in Washington that they're holding hands, uniting? It was Mike Johnson as Republicans House Speaker working with the Biden White House to ensure the continuation of warrantless eavesdropping? Well, you know, Mike Johnson's a constitutional attorney, and I think he would, have, he would know better. Uh, maybe his tenuous position has caused him to rethink. But let's look at it this way. Start with the FBI. In 2021, they had over 3 million uh, FISA searches of Americans. In 2022, there were hundreds of thousands of, of queries, or, or rather hundreds of queries per day. And in 2020 uh, 20, uh, and in 2021, the FBI conducted over 278,000 searches of the 702 database, which is a clear violation of their own rules. So this national security state is a danger to our Constitution. It's, it, it opens the door to a police state. Had I been in Congress, I would have broken that tie and, and the Biggs Amendment would have passed. Uh, I, I will tell you. Uh, Glenn, that my experience in Congress, seeing uh, this, uh, uh, being in briefings where intelligence uh, operatives would lie to Congress, uh, watching Congress spying, or, or rather watching the intelligence agencies spying on Congress. Look what happened with uh, Senator Feinstein and her intelligence committee. I myself had an, uh, an incident where one of the intelligence agencies intercepted a phone call to my office, violating the separation of powers, and then turned around and gave the, the actual recording to a DC newspaper uh, so that they could see the conversations I had to try to stop an escalation of the war against Libya. So, you know, at the beginning of each Congress, members of Congress are asked to sign a note that they will not divulge any classified information. I stopped signing that because the whole thing is a charade. And, and, and if you sign it and suddenly you take a position and they say, well, look what you did. You divulged classified information. It's a gotcha moment. I mean, the government lied about Iraq. Uh, you know, they've cost this country trillions of dollars with the lies. And frankly, for me, there is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as being true to one's country. And, and one way you can do it is you have to see through the lies. And these are eyes that can see through the lies. Absolutely. So let me ask you about Speaker Johnson, because you mentioned that he was a constitutional lawyer.
by chance, I actually had him on my show just a couple of months before he became House Speaker. Obviously, nobody knew at the time that that was even possible. And I remember walking away very impressed with his knowledge, but also his passionate commitment to the beliefs he had, including the dangers of having the U.S. security state have this wide range of powers of censorship and warrantless eavesdropping. He was also vehemently opposed to more funding for the war in Ukraine. He then becomes speaker and he has a 180 degree reversal on multiple issues within a matter of a couple of months, including now he's, a, he, he's promising to get $60 billion more to Ukraine. He was the key vote. He was the one who made it a tie by voting in favor of warrantless eavesdropping against the Biggs Amendment. Now, I presume you don't know Mike Johnson personally because you haven't served with him in Congress. I'm not asking you to speculate on his motives personally, but you have been in Washington for a long time. What is it about how Washington culture works? We obviously saw the same thing with President Obama. He vowed in 2008 when he was running to undo a whole range of war and terror programs that once he got elected, he instead embraced and even strengthened. What is it about the culture of Washington, the U.S. security state, that gets these people into their grasp and can get them to radically change their views on what seem to be very thoughtful and convicted principles in such a short period of time? Uh, I, I think what it comes down to is this, and this is not no disparagement of S Speaker Johnson, who probably has the toughest job in America. Uh, there is a desire to uh, join a consensus in Washington. It's a very powerful thing to be part of a party, to be in agreement. Uh, if you're in a position of real power inside the Congress, to hold that position. And when that happens, uh, often the Constitution is set aside. And I started at the beginning by talking about how the Constitution is under assault. You know, Article 1, Section 8 uh, is the one that empowers Congress to decide whether to go to war or not. That has been totally trashed by a series of administrations, you know, whether it was uh, Serbia, Iraq, Libya, S Syria, I Iran, there's various iterations of war. Uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7, check it out. That's the one that talks about the constitutional responsibility to make appropriations and also basically to keep the books. How do you end up with a $34 trillion national debt if that's what's happening? Uh, the Patriot Act clear violation of Fourth Amendment. But leadership in Congress went for it. Um, I read it. I didn't vote for it. The WTO, how did we get there? We gave away our sovereignty to WTO, GATT, NAFTA, China Trade. I mean, these are all things. This is a Washington consensus. It's about uh, the blob, about going along with it instead of going back to the Constitution, which is really our guide, as should have been the guide in the FISA debate. Fourth Amendment, again, set aside. Uh, this World Health Organization uh, treaty sets aside five different constitutional amendments. I, I mean, we are the leadership when they get in there, it's about staying in power and it's not about empowering the American people through upholding the Constitution. Now, back in the day when the war on terror was unfolding and a lot of these civil liberties abuses were taking root in the name of fighting terrorism, I think it's fair to say that the Republican Party was more or less united, a few exceptions, but largely united behind this scheme of laws that abridged civil liberties in the name of fighting terrorism. And there were a lot of Democrats on board with it too, but at least the, the opposition to the extent there was largely came from the left, from the Democratic Party. I looked at your social media account last week or, or when, when the FISA vote was happening, and I saw that you were retweeting and promoting several people, clearly conservatives, on the right who were vehemently opposed to renewing warrantly sieve dropping people like uh, Jim Jordan and Anna Paulina Luma. I think you heard my last segment talking about how Tucker Carlson and Candace Owens are conservatives who have started really questioning Israel, opening up a lot of space for skepticism of the U.S. security state as well. Do you see any kind of a potential realignment in terms of the two parties' views, or at least more space in the Republican Party to question a lot of these policies that maybe 10 or 15 years ago they were united in support of? Yes, and I think that my candidacy will help uh, underscore that there are people in both the Democrat and Republican Party who are looking for a, a center place to be able to rest, that partisan politics has reached its terminus that the hyperpolarization uh, makes 
party more important than anything. My candidacy is about putting country above party. And I intend to do that. And members of Congress, such as the ones that you mentioned, participating in the debate, Representative Jordan, uh, Biggs, uh, Representative uh, Luna, uh, and, and, and uh, Gates and others, have taken a strong stand for the Constitution. And I think that's where it starts. We take, at the beginning of a congressional session, we actually articulate an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States. And I took that seriously, which is, you know, one of the reasons I voted against the Patriot Act and one of the reasons why I kept voting against wars, because, we, you know, they were not about protecting the Constitution. It wasn't about protecting American interests. It was about the opposite. So, you know, do I think that there's a, a center point around which people can coalesce? Absolutely. Am I intending on behalf of the people of the 7th District? And, and, the, and the rest of the people in the other districts to be able to uh, help lead to create that space, to kind of tease it apart so that we can see that, uh, that there is an underlying unity in America about the things that Amer all Americans care about. You know, our Constitution, our, 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 our the Bill of Rights in particular, uh, our, our economic interest. I mean, Americans want Congress to do something uh, to protect them uh, economically and politically. And I think that we could actually, Glenn, be moving in that direction. And I, I hope that my candidacy helps to demonstrate the potential of such an approach. So a couple more questions for you, just in respect to your time. Um, this is not a new perspective for you, this idea that you can build these bridges or coalitions across party and ideological lines in defense of civil liberties and against war and the like. I remember very well when you were running for president in the Democratic Party in 2007 and you were asked who might you consider to be your vice presidential running mate and you said at the top of your list would be Ron Paul, the longtime conservative Republican congressman from Texas who was so interesting because he was one of the most principled opponents of warmongering foreign policy and the neocon ideology, but also in defense of civil liberties. Talk about what it is that, that you were, because I remember how shocked and even indignant a lot of Democrats were that you would say something like that. But what is it that you saw back then and how do you think it applies now to your candidacy and to our current political state? Thank you so much. That's a terrific question. Well, first of all, Ron Paul and I saw uh, a, a point of, co of coalition on the issues that related to war and the folly of the United States going into one war after another. And so we were closer together and we were joined by others such as Walter Jones, rest his soul, and uh, Jim Duncan and others. And we articulated a point of view that war is not inevitable. Peace is inevitable. We should, you know, use diplomacy. And we should remember these wars are put on a national credit card and they're, they're breaking our nation's capacity to meet the real urgent needs of our people. Ron Paul is a straight shooter. He's a good man. Uh, what I tried to do in Congress is to build personal relationships with people. I, I knew there were things we're going to disagree on. But the things that you might agree on can really change the direction of a country. And so when I mentioned Ron Paul's uh, possible running mate in 2007, despite the fact that I gave some of my colleagues and the vapors, <laughs> I felt it was really important to be able to uh, show that I, uh, my view is not dichotomized. I don't, I don't think in terms of polarity. I, I have a unified field theory view of the uh, of the country and the world that that we're, we are the the underlying dynamic of the world i believe is that uh is human unity that we're, we're interdependent we're interconnected and the human genome theory says the 99.9 percent .9 of us we're all the same so war then is stupid war defies the the logic of the universe and so i'm I'm looking for always an opportunity to draw uh, order from the chaos that seems to be ever present. And when I travel the country twice as a presidential candidate, I witness that underlying unity. Partisan politics looks for ways to try to divide people in order to, uh, uh, to build the uh, fortunes of political parties only for the sake of having power. 
And, you know, George Washington and others warned about the dangers of partisan politics. And I'm saying right now, as an independent candidate for the United States Congress, I intend to make a difference and to work with people on both sides of the aisle to, to address our commonalities, to address the mutual interests of the American people, whatever their political philosophy or political party. But we need to start looking at the world as not as one. We cannot continue to proceed with the idea that there are enemies out there that need to to be destroyed, because that thinking ultimately will destroy our own country. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's a, a little bit uh, in the realm of political gossip. But you were RFK Jr.'s campaign manager for his presidential campaign. We had him on our show. There was a lot that he said that I really liked, that I thought was important to be heard, although he was more extremist even than the Democratic Party when it comes to his support for the state of Israel and the need of the United States to finance it. Was that position part of why you left the campaign? And if if so, or if not, what was the decision making behind your departure from his campaign? Well, first of all, about uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. I've known him for 30 years. He asked me to run his campaign. I agreed to do it because I believe then and I believe now he's a good person. He's somebody who uh, really cares about the country. And he's been through it himself. He has taken heroic uh, personal decisions to conquer uh, numerous type of addictions that most that would have destroyed other people. He's a, he's a very special person. Now, in running the campaign, look, if you've ever managed a political campaign, it's, uh, it's an interesting um, exercise. And so I think that there was a, a coincidence of, uh, uh, of uh, forces going on. One was the evolution of the campaign and direction it was going. I took it to a certain point and thought, you know, uh, this is about as far as I could take it. And I was glad to be helpful to get my uh, to have my friend get started. Uh, were there differences on certain policy questions? Of course. But he's the candidate. I wasn't. Uh, but as the candidate, uh, I wanted to make sure that he had a campaign manager who was going to be consistent with him on everything. Uh, you know, on the issue of Israel, there's no greater supporter of Israel than Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, I have another view of how to support Israel. My view of supporting Israel is, uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, be careful about overstepping to where you could actually destroy the very state you're trying to advance. And uh, but, you know, Mr. Kennedy has a different view. Would that in and of itself uh, been enough to cause me to leave? No. But, you know, there are other things. And I will just say that, you know, I wish him well. Uh, I'm on uh, my own path now. And I'm hopeful that uh, if, you know, people go to Kucinich.com, if you like what you hear, help us out. This campaign is really just as much about changing the uh, country from inside the Congress as a campaign for the president is about changing the executive branch. So I was going to ask you, actually, at the end, where people should go to learn more about uh, your campaign, your positions, how they can support it. But we'll put the link as well at the bottom of the video. So my last question for you uh, is before October 7th, the major foreign policy debate that was dominating the Biden administration was the decision by the United States to involve itself in the war in Ukraine, financing Ukraine and its attempt to ward off the invasion from Russia. Here we are now two years later, and even if people who at the beginning hoped that the Ukrainians could uh, win, I think it's very clear now, there are very few people who deny it, that the Ukrainians aren't going to win. They have a shortage of artillery and even more importantly, a shortage of people to send to the front line. What has been your view on this debate over the U.S. role in Ukraine and how do you see that war now? You know, I, I go back to uh, 2000. I've been to Ukraine several times and I met with various leaders. Uh, I saw the uh, United States, particularly under the uh, uh, instance of one Victoria Nuland, move to uh, overthrow the government of Ukraine and to put in uh, uh, a, a leader or leaders who would be more congenial to challenge uh, the, uh, the Russian government at its core. Uh, and so the events that happened in uh, Donetsk and, and, and Luhansk in the Donbass region were uh, uh, followed this attempt by the United States to destabilize 
uh, Russia. The people of Ukraine have paid a horrible price. The people of Ukraine believe strongly in freedom. Uh, when they say Slava, Ukraini, they mean it. Freedom in Ukraine is something that people live and breathe. And, and the, they, you know, the Ukrainian leaders filed the United States government attempts to attack, uh, to go after Russia. Russia responded, I do, I do not take any delight in seeing anybody killed in that battle, but Ukraine paid a horrible price. What I'd like to see now happen, Ukraine has to be rebuilt. The people have to be given a chance to be uh, restored. Uh, it, they have suffered horribly. And, and my heart goes out to the people on both sides who have paid a heavy price for uh, this uh, foreign entanglement. But I think the war, you know, this war is effectively over. And now, uh, uh, you know, in the words of, uh, of President Lincoln after the Second World War, when he, you know, in his second inaugural, he talked about with malice towards none, with charity towards all, you know, let's bind up the wounds. And America, who helped to open those wounds, really needs to be in a position of binding them up. Well, I've been following your career for a long time. Um, I have always found you to be an interesting person in Washington, and I'm glad. I'm always interested in any campaigns that are running as an independent against this bipartisan consensus, trying to unite people around common principles. So we will definitely continue to report on your uh, campaign. We would love to have you back on the show. We will put the link to your website underneath the video for people interested in finding out more or how to support you. And we really appreciate you taking the time tonight to come and talk to us. Glenn, thanks a lot. And I've been following your career, too. Uh, this book with liberty and justice for some, which I've uh, read uh, over and over, is something that ought to be read for those who care about equal application of the law. That's very nice of you to say. Have a great evening. We will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.